You pay attention with so much at stake. Seas are rising and chronic flooding will be the new normal. You navigate, you listen, you keep an ear out. You pay attention and so do we. We tell the stories of our time every day. In the 26th day of testimony and on the 139th witness, Shahar Zarnayev wept. We unearth what would otherwise stay hidden. There's just a lot of hate in this world. And that day, for that hour, we were humans. Across the street. The Red Sox have won the World Series. And around the globe. It's here and now. This is Modern Love. This is WBUR's All Things Considered. This is only a game. This is On Point. This is Radio Boston. On air, online, on demand, and on stage in the heart of Boston. I'm Jack Lepiars. Welcome to WBUR City Space. Always looking forward, paying attention, and knowing that your story is one of our stories. Good morning. I'm Bob Epps. I'm Lisa Mullins. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. I'm Jeremy Hobson. This is 90.9 WBUR Boston. Welcome, my name's Amy McDonald. I run this joint, it's killing me. How many people, this is your first time here? Great, come back. Um, I like to call City Space the 92nd Street Y of Boston. There's nothing like it. So we do the WBUR policy debates. We have author lectures. We have uh, policy discussions, but we also do music. We've had an opera here. We've had dance, we've had hip hop. We've had live podcasts. We have a cooking series. We have everything. There are microphones outside, so what you hear inside, you hear outside. It's such a streetscape. I know tonight with David Byrne, we're going to have people standing on those benches, and they're going to be noses glued to the glass. So check out what's coming up in the fall, wbur.org slash city space, and come back. And before I introduce David Byrne and Robin Young, to give you a little preview, a little tidbit of what American Utopia is all about, here's this montage.
Ha. Hello again. That's David Byrne. <laughs> and, this is Robin. Uh, that's me. Yeah, who cares? Uh, David Byrne. And um, just a couple things. First of all, thank you all for coming to City, City Space. I echo Amy. David Byrne, thank you for coming here. We so appreciate thank you. it. And there, there's something I like to do over the course of the evening. Every now and then, the tea stops right there, and we can stand up and wave at everybody on the tea. Oh, they're out there right now, some people. Hi, hi. <laughs> um, and lucky us, we're in here. Um, so David Byrne is bringing America Utopia to the Emerson Theater in September. Get tickets. There are still some tickets left, but we're going to find out about it tonight. Began as an album release in 2018, a tour through 27 countries, New songs, some with Brian Eno, um, tracks from Talking Heads Incorporated. Uh, now with director Alex Timbers and choreographer Annie B. Parson, it's headed to Broadway through Boston, which, as everyone in Boston says, yeah, everything goes through Boston first. Um, when did you know this thing that was an album was also going to be a stage show? I knew right away about the that the album was going to be a concert of some sort, and I... As I was making the record, um, parts of it sounded very percussive, and, and, and I, I thought, ooh, I can imagine this. I can imagine this on stage. And I knew almost immediately that my dream was to have all, the whole band, all the performers, be untethered, um, be able to move about the stage, which meant that the drum duties, rather than a drummer sitting in a kit on a platform or that, that sort of thing, you'd have to break it apart so that one, one is playing a kick drum and one's playing a snare and one's playing uh, this and that. The kind of what a marching band would do or a second line group in New Orleans or a samba school or something like that. The, the duties are spread around. And that's, I imagined that right away. And that, so that was my dream. I wasn't sure if I could afford it because it meant more people. Uh, I imagined... Technically, I, I had an idea how technically it could be done, and so that's so that was the start. And then I, from there, should I just go on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> from there, I realized, well, um, I, I, I try and be a practical person. So I went to my the booking agent and said, um, "What do you think I'm going to make on this tour <laughs> per week?" Not the whole thing, but per week, so I can judge how many musicians can I afford, and so you can work backwards that way. And it's, he was, sometimes as agents are, he was very optimistic, and, but he was correct, and I could afford it. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go, gonna go ahead with this idea of everybody untethered. And then I realized that if you do that, other things start to fall into place. It means that um, there doesn't have to be anything on the stage. No instruments, no mic stands, no water bottles, no, no water bottles, uh, no speakers or lighting instruments or anything else. The stage can be a desert, nothing, just a flat expanse. So that, and no cables, nothing. So we can move anywhere we want, backwards, forwards. We know we're not going to trip over anything. We might bump into one another, but that's it. So I thought, that's pretty exciting. I don't know if I've seen that except with uh, a couple of uh, rap artists, but that's just because it's one guy and a microphone. Um, so then I thought, how you, you can't tell it's an empty space <laughs> um, unless you put a border around it. Um, you know, because if, if you don't put a border, then you're going to see all the junk around the side, all the, the boxes that the uh, instruments come in and the, all the people, the crew out there and everything. So it won't look empty. It'll look like there's people lurking around the edge and stuff. So I said, okay, we have to figure out how to make to a container. Um, and we went through a couple of different ideas of um, using this kind of mesh fabric um, so that if there was any wind, when you would be playing some outdoor places on, uh, last year, and there were, there's these mesh fabrics, and we thought, okay, 
Uh, they're rated by how much wind can <laughs> blow through it. We tried some of them, and no, they all just kind of went like that and, and <laughs> became a sale. And I thought, okay, this is not going to work. Um, and then a, a guy I was working with suggested using this very lightweight aluminum chain. And that's what we ended up with. Uh, we, so that, it, that's it. Yeah, it's very lightweight. And so the, just as the untethering opened up possibilities, using this chain opened up possibilities. It, immediately, we looked at it and, and went, hey, we can enter and leave anywhere on the stage. It's not like, oh, here's where you enter and here's where you leave. You can come and go anywhere. Um, so we thought, OK, that gets incorporated. That possibility gets incorporated into what we do. Um, so th that's, uh, that's all the practical. Right, the practical. But that's all the practical part. That's, like, that's what's there. It's not, that doesn't tell you why. And, and more what, which is... I shouldn't have said that, because now... Yeah, because, <laughs> because there, there's a story. I mean, that's sort of how you started to physically think of this as a stage show. But then I understand that some friends said to you of the album, you know, there's a narrative here. It's not something I can put my finger on, but there's a narrative here, there's a story. And I'm thinking, you know, your music always feels like a story. You might find yourself living in a shotgun shack behind the wheel of a large automobile in a beautiful house with a beautiful wife. I'm thinking, yeah, there's a story. We're building a story here. Um, but when they said of this that it's a narrative, I've... We're at a little disadvantage because I haven't seen the show yet, and the show is actually being retooled as we speak. And a little bit. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be so. Whatever, if somebody did see it previously, it might be a little bit different. But I did, you know, listen through to the album, and I'm looking at some of the lyrics. So the first cut, I dance like this. We dance like this because it feels so damn good. If we could dance better, well, you know, we would. And then um, gasoline and dirty sheets. Someone in a dangerous place. Someone got lost somewhere. Many people locked outside. Many people lost out there. I'm like, okay, it's getting scary. Um, every day is a miracle. Roses pruned to a perfect shape. Um, one of my favorite lines, what does it feel like to be a tongue moving around in your mouth? <laughs> and, and I could go on. <laughs> but as I'm, you know, oh, I love the dogs. We're all, we're all dogs in our paradise. Dogs dances doing duty, <laughs> doggy dreaming all day long. But I wasn't seeing a storyline <laughs> emerge there. And okay. I know you say I don't want you don't want to be asked, you know, what is the narrative? Um, but what is well, the narrative? <laughs> it's, well, it's not a narrative like. Um, a conventional play, let's say, but it's more—it's—it's it's an arc. Um, it's a, a journey of the person. I guess it would be me, but it's not necessarily uh, autobiographical. It's not, uh, yeah. it's not me telling my story of. Well, well, then I went to New York, and then this episode. I'm not doing all that, um, but it's—I'm kind of making it. A, I think a little bit more universal. But it is a story of, uh, I mean, it starts off with me on stage holding a brain. And I, I sing the first song. And I'm, as I'm singing, I'm kind of describing different parts of the brain and pointing those out like it's a little science lecture. But it's a guy living, obviously, living inside his head. You know, that's, and he's holding it in his hand. And um, so that's kind of the beginning. I feel like in the middle. This is a person who begins to is asking all these questions. How, how you know, how do I do this? How do I work this? How, what, um, what am I supposed to do? How, how, how am I supposed to? How is a person supposed to be? That seems like a continuation of a theme. Yeah, it, it's not so, so. That's something that occurs in a lot of my songs. So I thought that's handy. I mean, I, I have songs that. That say that express that, and I can use that as, as a stepping stone. Uh, gradually, it seems like that person finds a a community, the band, all these people moving around. We're all moving around together and doing things together. That they're kind of a, a community, a family, like-minded people. Um, that allows this person to kind of come out of themselves a bit, and then. 
by the end, the community, everyone ha is becoming more socially engaged. They're engaging with the, the wider world. Not so it's not just a little bubble. It's, a, it, it's a deciding to take action and be engaged in the wider world. Because you've said that of yourself. Yes. Uh, but I, yes, I think it's very much about, it comes from things that have happened to me and my changes I've gone through, but I don't think of it as being particularly autobiographical. I think it's a common journey and thing that a lot of people go through. Well, what I love about one of the descriptions, and I can't wait to see it, um, but what I've heard from one of your descriptions is that it, the, one of the reasons that it's not a narrative and it's not something where you could listen to the lyrics of the songs and go, aha, it's because it is something you see demonstrated on the stage. You see yeah, it. Yes, like when I'm saying this person finds a kind of community to be with, you sense that. You sense that by, by seeing the musicians working together, seeing how they react and respond to one another. That's, some, that's something you kind of experience. Um, you don't have to be told that that's happening. You're seeing it. Yeah. Well, actually, a lot of Broadway is, and now I'm going over there, and I'm going to be over there, and I'll talk to you over there. You know, that's yes. what a lot of Broadway is, you know. Yeah, well, there's a lot of, yeah, yes. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, um, we're in love now, and, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but this isn't that. <laughs> no, my, my, the, this is, I want, uh, the ambition is that the audience viscerally feel those things happening and that they they don't have to be told uh, because it's another kind of Broadway thing it's also true for movies but that, that the adage uh, show don't tell don't tell the audience what's happening show them what's happening and you do with this choreography um, and everything that's going on on the stage we want to see a little more of it but the purpose now, I, I want to talk a little bit about the music, and Adam has some pieces that he's going to be playing uh, for us. And again, you know, there's not much video available because this show is being, you know, recreated as we speak. But um, much of your music always has felt to me like an invitation to not just dance in many cases, but to march around. And you were just mentioning, you know, you know it just feels like that. And then I, I, you came up with, with this idea, which is one of my favorite things that you've done. And I don't know how many of you are aware of the 2015 project where David got a lot of color guards together. He had this idea to bring together these, you know, groups from high schools and colleges, the color guard, the people who fling up the bayonets and catch them and have the flags they wave around, and, uh, and I, the groups that I love, and to pair them with with artists like Nelly Furtado and St. Vincent, um, and then do this kind of synchronized dance performance. Um, part of it was done in, in Brooklyn. And then there was a documentary made, and I urge everyone to, to try to see it, Contemporary Colors, about that event. And that, to me, was so key. And what we'd like to do is play a little bit of the trailer for that documentary so you can see what I'm talking about with this Color uh, Guard project. And then we're going to see some of American Utopia, one of my favorite songs from uh, the show, performed on uh, Stephen Colbert. So let's start, <laughs> with, let's start with the Contemporary Colors, a little bit of that uh, documentary trailer. Who doesn't know what Contemporary Colors? Go ahead. Okay, so contemporary color is this thing. Anyone who David Byrne is? Okay, you're going to be an actor. It's going to include 10 color guards and composers. You have been invited to meet in the concert. <laughs> oh, if you're like me, you're probably wondering, what is it about color guard? Well, tonight, you're going to find out. Body, 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 body. Gentlemen, we invite you to take your seats and get ready. I was 
10 teams, 10 artists on their biggest stage. So that's that. And here you are. Isn't that magnificent? And, oh, and, and here you are on Stephen Colbert. And this is the part of the song, Everyone is Coming to My House, when you and the band start marching off the stage. Let's listen. <laughs> And I thought, that's it. That's David Byrne, everybody. And I thought, Can I explain the the contemporary color, the color guard thing? I want you to start there. How did that happen? Well, uh, some color some color guard licensed some music that I had done, some instrumental music that I'd done. And I said, oh, they're a high school group, no charge, but send me a video of what you do. Uh, nothing happened, and then a year later, I got a, not just a video, I got a DVD of the World Champions competition. And I thought, what is, I put it on, and it, it, technically it's called Winter Guard. Color Guard is what they do with the football teams, um, where they're kind of in formation. When the, when the football season's over in the winter, they go indoors into the gymnasiums and stuff, and they do themed uh, routines like what you saw little excerpts of and the, the themes some of them are just kind of geometric and abstract and then some of them are about issues of the day uh, there was one that I saw was about abduction I think that was in the show um, kind of really serious issues and then other ones are a little more playful um, and it was it opened up a door. It was another world for me. I thought, look what these kids across the country are doing. And certainly here, us in New York, we don't know about this. They know about it in uh, Ohio. They know about it in Texas and different places. But they, but a lot of you know, my friends had never heard of it. So I, and I thought, um, <laughs> uh, immodestly, I thought, what if I paired them with really cool music? <laughs> Sometimes the music they use is, you know, artists that you know. But sometimes it was maybe not the coolest choice. So uh, that was the idea, um, <laughs> and so we started going out and researching and looking at different teams to see what they were doing. Though you saw a little tiny piece of one of the teams, I forget where they're from exactly, but. Um, their theme was Hitchcock. So 
you saw a little bit of these shower stalls that got wheeled out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of them, one of the themes was uh, like a, a mental institution. And uh, so, the, and, and as I said, one was uh, abduction. And so it can go to things that are being kind of really dark and, and serious to be things that are just completely wacky, uh, which is what I loved. And we, uh, we I love that you, because anyway. uh, I love um, marching band step competition. I love all of that stuff. And you see it as an American folk art. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's an art form. It's a creative form that's out there that, that I felt being underappreciated. Well, so one of the, an interesting thing happened. Speaking of when, when I was asked about the narrative of my own show, um, I we before we did it in Brooklyn, we did it in um, Toronto, and at that time, the writer Naomi Klein and her husband lived there, and I said, "Come and see this thing that I'm doing." And I had lunch with them the next day, and they said, "You know what that show's about." That show's about inclusion. Their, their kids are kind of all different body shapes and races and genders and everything else. And it's a, the color guard world is a world that admits everyone. Everyone gets to be talented and be a star and be appreciated. So for a lot of these kids, it's a lifesaver. Um, I didn't you know, decide to do the, that project because of that, but it revealed itself. Well, it's a wonderful thing, and wonderful how you then elevated them even more. But I also saw, what's so clear to me is that, you know, your music is so percussive at times. I mean, not everything, but you, it seems to me like you, you were born to be in a marching band, you know? <laughs> and and it's to see you, you know, everybody's coming to my house to see you marching around right off having watched some of the, uh, the contemporary colors. It was like, that's it, you know, that's the key to um, your, your music. I mean, I know when you started Talking Heads, you were adamant, we don't want to move like rock stars. We want to find even different ways uh -huh. to move. We want it to be and feel different. And there's a, a video, if, uh, uh, if you Google it, there's a wonderful video of um, uh, everyone's coming to my house. And it's a line drawing of David, and the lips are moving, and he's singing the lyrics in this kind of pencil line drawing. And <laughs> can I just read you some of the comments on, underneath the... the sure, it's been I, viewed I like two million it. times. So remember again the line drawing of David with his uh, lips moving. <laughs> First comment is, funny how this video is talking heads. Um, <laughs> and again, it's everybody's coming to my house, but what if it's into his beautiful house? He invites me in his house and then decides to burn it down. Um, <laughs> next comment, protect David Byrne at all costs. I don't know why that's... <laughs> and then the next comment, and you may find yourself in David Byrne's beautiful house. <laughs> Which is just a reminder, what's with you in houses and homes? Oh. <laughs> Burning them down. Um, I'm not sure. A, a house is, uh, it's probably a kind of psychological, symbolic kind of thing. A house is maybe the, the soul or the self or something like that. Um, I think chairs or people. Um, you think they have souls? No. No, not. But, no. Um, no, because I, I, there's some people here who know that when I have to throw away something because it is just so old that he will not allow it to remain in the house, I get very emotional about mm -hmm. that. No, I mean that uh, the chair, when you look at a chair, look at it. Um, it has a character like a person. It has legs and little arms and things like Big that. Big smile it, on this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what this one's character is, but... But they do, yeah, they have, they have a little character. Takes things on. Well, and you're observing this. And that reminds me of one of my favorite lines in that song, but maybe in um, the whole show, um, American Utopia, which is in this song, we're only tourists in this life, only tourists. But the view is nice. Now, a couple things. First of all, when you write a line like that, do you have to run to a database to make sure no one else has written it? <laughs> Seriously, I mean, are you... That's a great line, but... Well, thank you. No, I, I, I didn't. I kind of assumed that maybe a friend would tell me. If it, <laughs> so, hey, this... No, that's already been written? That's been done. 
That's a great line. But it is. It is. It sounds like one of those like what? Nobody's done that. Used right. that yet? Because it's like, you sure the Beatles didn't? We're only tourists in this life, only tourists, but the view is nice. And it reminds me that, um, you know, many have said of you that you seem to have this detached air and you're observing everything. I mean, one of the comments about that song is like, I just love David Byrne. He seems to just look around and names things that he sees. <laughs> you know? There's a chair. There's a, um, but... To some people, um, and, and when you do, it's as if you're startled by it, like seeing it for the first time. It yes. feels, I don't know, is anybody getting this sense of some of the, yes. And others have taken that a step further and um, said, you know, he's an alien, and that's why. <laughs> and are amazed to find out that at the age of eight, your family from Scotland um, went to Canada, and then at eight, you went to Maryland, grew up in Maryland. Yes, yeah, yeah. That doesn't feel right to me. I mean, it seems it, like the wrong trip. Or? Wrong way to go? No, it's just like alien felt, you know, more something other, <laughs> other world. Oh, it seems too ordinary. Well, Maryland, we love Maryland, but um, <laughs> it just, it just, you feel at times otherworldly. Do you feel that way, that sometimes you're watching us all more than participating, or is that? Not just us all, it includes me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sometimes observing myself, um, and... And well, I'm just asking, why? Yeah, why do I do that? Well, um, look at what I'm doing. Why am I doing that? Or should I be doing what these other people are doing? Um, look at the way they. Maybe it's coming from another country and being plopped in, and you go, okay, now I got to figure out how I'm supposed to do. How am I supposed to behave? Yeah. What do I? How do I eat? Do I hold a knife and a fork in the same hand, or do I do this? Switch around thing that, that they do over here, you know what I mean. Well, you have to figure fact, it out. One um, note about your having come here from another country at the age of eight and then living here. Do I understand that when you started voting, you just went and voted and had no oh, idea boy. that you were not registered to vote <laughs> or not? And and it, 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 you you were stopped one year and they said you can't vote. You're not. You don't have. Which by the way, well, that's where I got around fast. <laughs> but that makes you. Really, the only voter fraud, I think, that anyone's ever yes, found. Yes, here it is. There, <laughs> there is voter fraud. <laughs> yeah. um, but that, that, that feels a little detached. And, um, you know, not having registered to vote. Or, but um, I had my own... Uh, I believe that the law said that if you had a, a green card, you could vote for everything except president. So I didn't pull that lever. Okay, all right. But you have registered since. Um, <laughs> yes, well, I have. Well, and I, I don't know if this is even tender, but I, I wanted to ask you also, because I've heard you've spoken of it. I, didn't, I couldn't find it myself. But um, I've heard that you have said what um, Tina Weymouth once said of you, um, which I'm, I think this was at a tender time. Um, uh, and so I don't think she said it. I think she said it in... She wasn't as happy with you at this time. But she said, well, you know, he has Asperger's. Mm -hmm. And then I... I didn't know what that was then. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, after some other friends had told me about the kind of the spectrum of Asperger's and autism, and I thought, oh, I, yeah, I can see that. That uh, certainly at, diff at an earlier point in my life, not so much now, um, there's a part where I felt very uncomfortable socially. And so I thought, oh, okay, yes, I can see the where I'll fit on that. Some of those things that, yeah, seem, I, I seem I can identify with that. It's the very functioning end of the autism spectrum. Yeah, yes, yeah, the very functional end. So I could certainly function fine. But, I, but, but socially, very uncomfortable. Um, probably the idea of observing and asking, like, am I supposed to do that? Is that the way, you, is that what people do? That probably goes along with it a little bit. Um, maybe kind of a, a sort of an intense focus on kind of the songwriting or the artwork that I was doing at the time, that kind of thing. It's probably so it's, as other people have said, um, a little bit isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, and when you, I felt like you don't know, however we are, whatever, you know, 
we don't know how to be another way. It's, that's the way we are. And you change over the years uh, and become someone else, someone different than you were before. But, you, um, but at that earlier point, that's who you are. And it's not, you can't say, oh, I'm unhappy. I, I wish I was more like this uh, happy, gregarious person uh, who's so, more socially adept. I would just, I figured I'm not. I'll make friends with a socially adept person and they'll be the one that brings everyone in. <laughs> well, the, Paul and Kale has a great line. <laughs> Sounds very calculated, but I don't, I, no. it wasn't quite as much. We all need guides. We yeah. all need guides. Well, Paul and Kale wrote, this is w way early on, Byrne has a withdrawn, disembodied sci-fi quality and though there's something unknowable and almost autistic about him, he makes autism fun. And at that time, I hope you know, you, I'm sure you do, what that means to the community with autism. I mean, they, people are, they're out of their minds happy. So mm. they just, they uh, think that's the greatest thing they've ever heard. Um, that you might even be, a, a, ha, at some time, have been a part of their community. But when you say, you know, maybe you weren't happy and somebody else was, you are so cheerful, and you have, I just want to talk about the other part of, this is sort of a multi-project thing you're doing, because you also have the reason to be cheerful um, uh, platform, I guess. It's like, where you have decided, and damn it, why didn't I do this? Because I wanted to do this. Karen, didn't I want to do this? You have decided to go out, and there's so much negative news, to just curate good, happy news. Yeah, uh it's not quite as simple as that, but, oh. but it's generally true, yeah. yeah. Because good, happy news would be, uh, you know... Uh, not mindless. Yeah, mindless yeah. stuff. That's, yeah. It's not just... Uh, it has to be things that are really useful, that are really kind of rigorously checked and tested. Um, so, yes, I realized that I'd wake up in the morning and uh, kind of go crazy reading the headlines, reading the news of, of the day, and... But I would also start saving, if I read about some initiative that was really successful, um, doing something positive, I thought, oh, I'll save that into a folder. Um, and pretty soon, there were quite a few folders, quite a few things in there. And I thought, oh, there's quite a lot happening all over the world in kind of different cities, different communities, different, sometimes a whole country. Uh, that is actually kind of swimming upstream, maybe, uh, kind of... Like what? Fight. Do you have some examples? Well, of course, yeah. I have examples. Um, let's see. This is one that I I haven't written it up yet, but I've been... There was articles about it in, in recent... In the last couple of weeks. Um, can I tell this? It's a yes. little bit of a story. Okay. Can David Byrne do whatever he wants here tonight? Yes. I don't think you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, in in the '60s, I think it was mainly in Chicago. There was an idea, and it was not an unusual idea. The people asked if people in a kind of segregated, probably a poor neighborhood, if they could move to a, another neighborhood that where the data said people uh, did better, got better jobs, went to college better schools, et cetera, et cetera, would they then be transformed into a person who was one of those more successful people? Um, over the years, various attempts were made to do this. And, uh, and to kind of make a long story shorter, the, there were attempts during the Clinton era where they would give vouchers in, uh, I think it was, might have been Chicago, it might have been Seattle, where they said, OK, we'll give you a voucher there's this other uh, county or part of the town over here where there are houses, and we'll make sure that there are. It's within your affordable range, but the schools are better, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So some of that happened, and then there was also a data a database of people who did move from uh, poor and segregated neighborhoods into what were then called opportunity neighborhoods. And when they looked at the results at first, uh, there was almost no, no change. So like if a mother and her 
child or children moved, the mother, her life actually didn't change all that much. But then years later, people came and re-looked at the data and they looked at the kids. And the huge change. The kids did change. So it goes by a generation. So um, that's a positive kind of bit of just data information. So now in Seattle, they did, they couldn't figure out, they tried it a number of times, and people didn't want to move. They didn't want to leave their neighborhoods. Um, but it wasn't because, oh, all my friends are there. It was just, it was too, they had too much, too much struggle, and it was just too confusing. So the latest thing was they created this group they called Navigators that um, would help people. They'd say, OK, here's the situation. You can move to this other area, but we will, uh, we will help you find a place. We'll help you talk to the landlord. We'll help you negotiate and navigate all that kind of thing. And that did it. Um, it was just overwhelming to people. And this did it. And the kind of success rate jumped from like 14% to 54%, uh, which means that Again, probably not the adults, but the children will more, more, most likely uh, be healthier, go on to college, have better, uh, better jobs and a, uh, income, and be more productive and all that. Uh, this is one of the stories that you've curated in this. Um, well, it's, so that one I haven't read yet, but it's one, you asked me for one that I'd heard recently, yeah. and that's yeah. It's a recent one. Which, what are some of the other ones? Because it's I mean, well, we should all go on the website because it does make you happy. Um, yes, we're kind of rebuilding the website now, but soon it'll be it'll all be back up and running. Um, another one is. Uh, <laughs> um, I asked. Speaking of traffic, Boston has traffic. Um, yeah. So I asked my, I, I asked, uh, I started looking around to see, well, how has it worked out? How has congestion pricing worked out in different cities? Um, and depending on how it's done, sometimes it works really well, and then sometimes it doesn't work so well. Um, so I kind of, you know, wrote up a thing of how. Um, for instance, I think in Sweden they did a did a congestion pricing thing that has worked out really well. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell if it's worked really well because if it's like over ten years and the traffic is more or less ends up the same, um, that doesn't seem like a big success. But then you have to factor in, yes, but <laughs> consider how many more people there would be if you didn't have this. Um, the some of the other ones said there's other factors. Like the, I think the, the London congestion pricing, they make uh, exceptions for kind of the uh, Uber and Lyft and all that and lots of other stuff. So there's so many exceptions <laughs> that, that the percentage that it actually affects is rather small. Um, so it is actually, the traffic there is now actually worse than it was <laughs> before the, the congestion pricing. Well, you are, I mean, as we said, an observer. You're, you're a good reporter. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not. I wish I was. Um, well, maybe someday that we'll get to that point. But I'm kind of culling it from re a lot of reading. And well, and it's reasons to be cheerful again. And, and, and reason to be cheerful. And again, it's um, part of this multi-platform, everything that you're doing right now. So tie them together, because I, I think I read you say that it's um, the American Utopia is the musical component of the entire project that includes reasons to be cheerful. <laughs> that makes it sound like one grand, grand plan, but it, there's a certain amount of truth to it. They, they both kind of emerge at the same time, and I think they both attempt to kind of uh, present a world of kind of that's more positive and a world of posi possibility, um, as opposed to. Oh, we're really screwed now. Yeah. Which is also true, but you have to <laughs> kind of figure out, okay, how are we going to push against that? Even though one of the songs, and we're not going to hear it now, but one of the songs 
is about a bullet. It's, it's, I mean, especially today, you know, especially after this weekend about a bullet. Here is the bullet going through somebody's skin like a lover parting the skin. And I believe you, you know, that ultimately this piece that uh, you're going to be presenting in September um, at the Emerson Colonial, um, that it, you know, it has this um, positive ending, but that is a grim. That's a grim one. One. Yes, it is. It is. Um, I think uh, the, the, the song itself is kind of heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and sadly, it, it has never not seemed to be of the moment. But I think what, hap- what you see on stage is you see the band doing, all, all creating this thing together. In that song, it's a kind of procession mm-hmm. and that they do together. And so you see evidence of this little community acting together. That, and that sort of, in a certain way, counters what the song is saying. So there's a, mm. there's a ah. you know what I mean? Yeah. It, but it's not in words. It's in what you see. Right. In fact, Adam, I think we have some pictures uh, that you guys have sent us, some stills of the oh. show. We can just look at some of them now. Um, that's that's just us standing. <laughs> okay. I'm starting to move around. Um, uh, uh, find out who. The, oh. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you can see everybody's got their instruments and they're all. Um, and they're happy. Mobile. This this is one where they're playing the instruments behind the chain. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Who's the guy with the red hair? Is he a particular character? And why don't you have shoes on? Okay. Um, I knew we. I, I, I knew we'd be wearing suits for some reason. I thought I knew we'd be wearing suits, and then I thought, Are we gonna? What, what do we put on our feet? Shoes yeah. could have been. Are we a- gonna have shoes? Are we gonna wear like uh, you know like what I've got on now? Are we gonna wear like black kind of uh, businessman shoes or so, something like that? And I thought, No, we can't do that. We have to do something that, that runs counter to the, the formality of the suit. So I thought, yeah, we'll be barefoot, and then we can. There's also a sense of being grounded on the. Yeah. It's not exactly the earth, but it is the ground <laughs> for us. Cannot wait. I want to do a little bit of a lightning round here because our, our evening is drawing to a bit of a close. I know. Where are we all going now? <laughs> David Byrne. Um, <laughs> um, you also have an entirely free radio show on the internet. Uh, this is David Byrne Radio Station. And you just, what, pick songs that you want people to Yeah, I make to a little themed playlist every month. Yeah. And, uh, but. It goes from um, Icelandic Pop, Eclectic Things, Viva Mexico, Parts 1 and 2. I saw this month's had William Shatner. Yeah, this month is covers. <laughs> Cover songs. And of course, William Shatner, yeah, does... Oh, I forget which one it is. He does a lot of them. Um, Someone left the cake out in the rain. Is that the one he, <laughs> he did do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's, yeah, it's just a, a sort of a way of asking the question, like, uh, what does it mean when one artist covers another another artist? I mean, I've done it. I usually in a lot of shows, I usually perform at least one cover song by somebody else. It's liberating because. Uh, the audience and you know that this is not me speaking, this is me kind of showing my love and appreciation for somebody else's work and we can all enjoy that and it's a little bit liberating but there's, yeah, but the range of covers that people do and the unexpected stuff like what? uh, oh my god, there's um, I can't even remember them all. I'm sorry, I can't remember That's, them all. Uh, Aaron, pull up the email. We have an email. Um, there's <laughs> <laughs> um, for this month. Well, it, it, what, what's one that you love to cover? I've done kind of really popular ones in the past. I did a, Whitney Houston and a. I want to dance with somebody, and so that's kind of you, it's a celebratory yeah. thing, and everybody knows it and sings along. Yeah, years before that, I did a. There was a disco song called uh, Gypsy Woman, which was, uh, I thought it was great because it was a disco song that was actually about 
homeless, a homeless woman. And I thought, this is a song that, that has something to say. It's not just, oh, let's get up and boogie. It actually has something to say. Um, okay, continuing the lightning round. You don't have to, you don't okay. have to if we, we will shout one out if we hear it. Um, cycling. I, a lot of people here have said, oh, I want to ask him about, you know, you, you ride your bike everywhere, even in New York, please be careful. And have um, designed um, cycle racks. I wasn't able to, so, so what kind of bicycle rack <laughs> did you design? Uh, I did it twice. Um, the first time I did it, I did it for specific New York neighborhoods. Um, and so they were kind of custom. So they were really expensive. Um, <laughs> The city did not have to pay for it. But for instance, in uh, Greenwich Village, I did a dog, because there's lots of people walking dogs. In Williamsburg, this was years ago, I did an electric guitar that was kind of half buried in the ground. Um, what else? Oh, yes, in um, <laughs> uptown where the big uh, fashion stores were at the time, uh, I did a high heel. And that kind, that kind of thing. Is there anything you can't do? Seriously, this is there really any, I mean, easy. novels, um, music for movies, uh, and TV, and um, you know, stage show? This isn't even your first stage show. You wrote a piece about Imelda Marcos and another about Joan of Arc. Um, and that may be coming back. The Joan of Arc may be coming. That would be nice. Broadway. I think I need to rework it. Though. Yeah, OK. Um, but is there something that uh, you're thinking, but there's this other thing I want to do? N no. I don't think so. Well, you have a radio show and you have a yeah, news website. And you're doing um, one thing at a time. I mean, yeah. or maybe a couple of things at a time, <laughs> but not too much. Um, the, the, I think the, the way I talked about how having people be uh, untethered and having the breaking up the band, that would lead to an empty stage and that led to the chain and that leads to this and that. Things happen like that, or like the color guard where it's like, I watched it and I thought, wow, what if? Yeah. Okay, Karen has some of the songs this month. Some? Just yell them out. Okay, um, Habina Rashid, Ha Ha. Everybody knows Sigrid. What the world needs to know now. Cat. Um, Cat Power, right? Yeah. Cat yeah, Power. Yeah, Power. Yeah, yeah. What is strange? Wings. Um, knocking on Heaven's Door. The Persuasions. Um, hurt. Johnny Cash. Superstar. Sonic Youth. And. Uh, Common people is the William Chapman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Karen. A so, really odd choice. But, so, so some of those are really well known. Uh, some of them, some of them, we know the cover more than we know the original. Yeah, great. Well, I want to hear whatever you want me to hear. So we'll be listening to <laughs> David Byrne Radio Station. So um, I've read that the Back to American Utopia again September. Grab tickets because it was going to it was quickly almost sold out. Um, that you were thinking of ending it, and it, it changes. You put some Talking Head songs in. You, you know, you have the original songs, but I, I don't know if this is still true that you're going to end the show with the Brian Eno collaboration one fine day. That's what we're going to try. We're going to try it in rehearsals and see if Can that you just works. Just listen to a tiny bit of that. It's not to be confused with the chiffons. I think Adam <laughs> has it <laughs> queued up. Although I was thinking maybe that, that would be funny. But let's listen. You have the video of this one. We, do, we just have the music. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I am feeling like this will end with, you know, I can see those tears. Everyone is true when that door opens, when that door appears, I'll go right through. That's, that's very sweet. Yeah, we're trying to end on an up note a bit. I did, I did this song with a, a youth choir, in Brooklyn Youth Choir, recently. And that, for me, was the breakthrough. I thought, oh, if we can do that arrangement where the... 
it, we'll try it where the band will just put down all their instruments and take off all their harnesses and do all that stuff. And so it's uh, just them and us, just us uh, singing. Mm. Um, I thought, oh, that we might be able to do something that way. I think you might be able to do something. <laughs> David Byrne, uh, thank you so much. American Utopia at the Emerson. It's coming in September. It's thank you. Friday. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Street.